What's going on, everybody? Cali Death Podcast back once again, episode 51. Uh, had a fucking awesome time last week with Terrence from Suffo. That was such a cool way to celebrate 50 episodes. And also, we put up that that uh, pilot episode we were talking about in, that, uh, in the 50th episode, too, Decrepitated Tormentation, if you want to see what we were like as a s- super infantile project. But here we are, starting our second year. Thanks, resident homies, Joel, Joseph, and Casey for taking some time out on your Sunday. And thank you, Hannes Grossman, for coming on and being with us on your Sunday as well. It's like 8 o'clock for you right now. 9 o'clock? It is. Not right 8 on, o'clock. Dude. For nine hours reversed. Like, uh, yeah, it's in the evening right now. But uh, Well, thanks for giving us your Sunday night, dude. Yeah, don't worry. It's no great problem. to have you, man. I'm really stoked to have you, man. Fuck yeah, dude. I mean, yeah. come on. It's Hannes Grossman, dude. The fucking one of the sickest drummers I've ever heard in my life, dude. So, <laughs> yeah. And now he's here on our show. So this is fucking awesome, dude. My pleasure. Hell yeah. Nice. nice. So, um, you know, we can just get right into it. We, what we usually do to start it off is just take us back to your childhood when, uh, you know, playing drums or if you started with a different instrument, what kind of music got you into wanting to play music? What, you know, when did you fall in love with music in general? Mm, I would say, I, well, I started actually with a classical piano. Um, I don't know. It's, um, yeah. At what age was that? Uh, it, it wasn't like um, something I, I chose, like I was burned for you know mm-hmm. but my parents thought it's a good idea to learn an instrument yeah. and you know, piano is more like you know, i don't know um and my dad plays the piano so that was pretty obvious so mm-hmm. and i mean I, um i never regretted it because it is a good way of understanding music in general to totally. um, start with a melodic instrument uh, especially piano um um i did a couple of years of that but yeah i i never liked the um play note by note kind of thing which you do with classical music um and uh i don't know i played piano like for one year i I started when i was about eight i would say and um um and then I got um, a friend of mine had a drum set at home, like a beginner drum set. And I just play. I didn't play on it. I just hammered like, mm-hmm. I don't know. Just beat it up. First time hitting a drum kit. Um, but it was pretty sensational. I remember it still. And uh, I thought, oh, I, I want to do this. And yeah, it, it felt like more felt more than just being like some kind of hobby or face but i thought like this is really the instrument i want to play mm-hmm. and uh yeah so uh, so when did you how old were you when well, what were you listening to at this time and like what, what age did you get when you actually got your own kit yeah i was like 10 years old i think mm-hmm. nine or 10 years i think 10 years and um I listened to 60s stuff. Nice. Like Beatles and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Like the records my parents owned. Fuck yeah. And with records, I mean records, like LPs. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That stuff, like all of the stuff um, from from back then, from the 60s and early 70s. So um, it's really the music I grew up with. And it's, um, I would say... um, still um an influence up to the yeah because it's like i still still love the beatles dude i i always have to go at least once a month with listening to some beatles dude yeah and um yeah it's like a good uh basis for for any rock musician i think like to listen to music in general from the 60s i mean there's not all the stuff is great or was great back then i mean there was like Stuff where I'm like, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, as a kid, I don't know. Yeah, you're not that picky. But I, I just found it interesting. And I guess this was like early 90s or something. So um, that was only like 20 to 30 years ago. So not that long ago. Like yeah. now it's really old. But back then, it, it you know, it wasn't. It was still more like, fresh. Uh, yeah. Re- 
kind of fresh yeah mm -hmm. but um it's a good basis for any musician i think a rock musician to to listen through all the stuff they come up with because that's like the in, initial years in, in in rock music i would say like with a lot of also with a lot of the playing techniques and the equipment being invented and of oh. course i i was obsessed with uh, john bonham he was like my first like role model uh, john bonham and ginger baker i would say so um yeah and keith moon so those were the guys i i started it with because they i thought they were really impressive and um that's how i wanted to play and the music i wanted to make was exactly that and that again with the classical music um I was back then I wasn't so much into it um, also because I didn't know too much classical music and um, how can I put it um, the stuff you get lot, lots of people they think of classical music as Mozart mm -hmm. you know and that stuff and I mean but the classical music there's just so much more and I just didn't know that I liked classical music but I just didn't hear the right stuff mm -hmm. You know? totally. So um, I like the more modern stuff better. And in fact, actually, if you, especially some of the Russian composers like Rachmaninoff or um, Slavinsky, and they're really close to sometimes to, to death metal or to, um, I think in terms of the notes they play, um, it's, mm -hmm. the instrumentation might be different, but the actual notes they play and the forms and stuff, it's really... Um, it can be adapted uh, by a death metal band really easily, and um, well, especially if you play in a cool band like if you did Necrophages or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you. Like, I mean that uh, that's very it. very inspired by classical music uh, in general. I would say right. also by ne neoclassical stuff, and um, yeah. So uh, I, I guess like classical music and rock music. What I didn't like ab about classical music was playing classical music. Because it's really like kind of stiff, mm -hmm. lack of a better word. Um, and Very you have to keep to the notes and you really have to appreciate that you can't just go wild on, on it and just improvise with it. So if you have like the traditional route of, of musicians that would say I'm either like a classical guy who sticks to like note sheets or I'm a jazz guy who likes improvisation. I was always more on the jazzy side of things. And um then um, after a couple of years, like learning the instrument, I also got like involved with some more of the jazz drummers and they have been like ever since a, a huge influence um, to me musically. Um, Sweet. So, um, what are some, some of your wise, favorites? Hmm? What are some of your favorite uh, jazz drummers? Uh, I would say, well, one of the early ones I heard was Tony Williams. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. No brainer. I I would say <laughs> that's like one of the big names and you stumble across it and you get a drum teacher and he he tells you um oh you should ch check this guy out uh, because mm -hmm. it's you know a classical a classic drummer. Um right. And yeah, um the lifetime stuff especially and the stuff he did with Miles Davis. But I would say like the first thing I heard of him was lifetime um with also with uh uh, what's what's the guitarist name? Uh, famous guy, Alan Holdsworth. Oh and, yeah. Um, oh yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I was blown away when I heard that. I, you know, I don't know. It was maybe fifteen or something. I didn't know what was going on. Um, nice. I was thinking you're album, able to play like that. The art of bop drumming. I, I just looked it up. I don't know if it's the right. Oh, name, yeah. John Riley. Is that, is yeah, that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that dude, one. that shit is fucking sick, dude. I love yeah. watching that stuff being played, no doubt. Like bop drumming, I didn't realize like it was a yeah. specific, you know, style of jazz drumming, but yeah, yeah dude, it's fucking sick. Yeah, shit. that's my favorite. That's really my favorite, like the bop, bebop drumming. I, I would say, actually, last year when there was such an, like the endless lockdown, um, I got back into like bebop drumming and jazz drumming. Um, you know, to, to, yeah, to um, explore my roots actually a little bit more and get back into swing pulse and all of that because I haven't been practicing it for years and it just goes away. It doesn't entirely go away, but you know, you know it sounds mm -hmm. stiff when you get back to it and it's not very musical, but eventually you can keep 
up with because before I did like necrophages and all that stuff, I studied um, not at the university but for myself with um, especially those kind of books and uh, also with like Steve Smith has really nice instructional DVDs um, that I think are really good to explain like the and like jazz as a whole genre like jazz drumming so that was interesting another drummer i um like from my early influences is billy cobham totally also an ob obvious choice i would say um and then of course buddy rich mm -hmm. um yeah and uh so, i feel like there's a lot of these drummers too that like it's like uh like when we had Derek Roddy on we had Derek, a couple of weeks ago, we had Derek Roddy on here and there was like a couple of drummers that Casey and Derek brought up that were like, of course, that's the one. I never watched well, them before. Like, Vin, like, which uh, one? Who, who, who was Vinny the drummer? Kaluta, Vinny Kaluta is the one that we were talking oh, about. What's, what's the, your yeah, best yeah, yeah. Thing, They're like, drummer, Vinny you know? Kaluta. I'm like, what? So, Vinny Kaluta? And I went, so, like, I went on a, a binge watching and I yeah. watched Vinny Kaluta the next day. Like, and I was like, Jesus Christ, especially that one Japan Chick Corea yeah. show. That's the one, uh, yeah. the Japan where he sat in and he has like a cigarette hanging out and he's. What's, like, what's the story again? Dude. Did he like 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 super short notice or something or like yeah. that's what that's what Derek Roddy was saying that he it was like, Dave Weckl was on the tour right and then he got he had to go home or something for a, yeah something, something then, like that and he had to just sit in and I watched like Vinnie Kaluuya yeah. and I'm like Jesus Christ like it seemed like they've been playing in the same room for twenty years together you know what I mean it's, it's very one of those yeah. like influential drummers that. It's cool to pick your guys' brain because I'm not like a drummer. To like yeah, I didn't know that. Drummers, you guys think because you guys are like drummers that I look up to, like well, as far as like percussionists and stuff. I think it's important too because like Hannes to me is like one of the drummers in death metal that has brought these other elements of dynamics and stuff out into the drumming on his album, totally. starting with all the stuff you did early on in Necrophages, of course, but I, everything you do, man, that newer Hate Eternal, like all kinds of stuff. Like you are a very musical player too, just like Derek Roddy is, and we were talking about that. So. I can definitely hear your influence by the stuff you've studied and being open to so many styles. It's it's sick, you know. Yeah, I would say like Vinny Kaluuya. Yes, obviously, like Vinny Kaluuya is the guy for any drummer. I, I guess there is no single drummer who doesn't like Vinny Kaluuya. I have never met yeah. a, a drummer <laughs> who wasn't impressed by the guy at least. If yeah. you're not into his music, I okay, yeah, get but that, at yeah. least you're like, oh my god, um, <laughs> yeah. Actually, um, my favorite Vinnie Coluda stuff is the stuff he did with Frank Zappa, because nice. I mm. was really into Frank Zappa's music mm -hmm. uh, when I was younger. So, um, so that's the stuff that stick still sticks with me. But uh, yeah. Um, so let's take it where, back where to, uh, yeah, I was going to say, let's take it back to you, you're, you know, getting into your teens, you're starting to beat the drums more. You get, you said you got your kid at 10. So when do you get to the point where you're like, I want to start jamming with other humans? Uh, pretty early on. Um, you know, there were two guys in my class, like, um, that were playing instruments and we got together and, you know, in lack of a better word, jammed. I don't know if <laughs> it's an appropriate term because I guess it sounded like shit. But <laughs> you know, <laughs> I don't have any tapes of that. Yeah. But uh, yeah, pretty early on, I guess with 13, 14, mm -hmm. I started playing with people. Um, but then um, this is the thing. Um, when I was like about 16, um, there was a band from my town that were looking for drummer and they played death metal. Well, more like the, uh, I would say, um, yeah, Germany. Germany uh, is pretty into the simple stuff like bolt thrower and six feet under, mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff. Um, I mean, they were into other stuff, but that's what they could actually play. And I thought, like, oh, well, I don't like that kind of music, but uh, they got gigs. Yeah. Yeah. I noticed so, how big, like how six feet under and stuff, like that, like they're huge out there. Like they're like, because Jeff is yeah, our yeah. friend, like we, you know, and it's like it's a very like a simplistic, but like old school style of death metal. But it's just comes over so like over in Germany, it's just like humongous, hundreds of thousands of people, like all at the same time. Like it's it's very interesting to watch that like that kind of a band be so big. So it's like disgorge in in the you know like when they go out to the of the Philippines. Sorry. Indonesia, Indonesia. yeah, yeah. Also, yeah, yeah. same thing though, though. You know what I mean, though. 
but it's yeah. like it's like it's like certain like bands just like jive with certain areas you know what i mean and it's like that's definitely something i've noticed is, is you know watching like six feet under videos like jesus you guys are like fucking rock stars and like like <laughs> it like you're like the beatles out there you know what i mean like it's a trip to watch that it's not that big but um <laughs> yeah they're doing pretty well you know don't throw the beatles out there doesn't it <laughs> the, the six feet under and the beatles in the same <laughs> yeah, yeah. well why not <laughs> Yeah, but no, it's very interesting to see that. Six that... feet under is the uh, Beatles of simplistic groovy death metal. Yeah, 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 ah. totally, definitely. You can accept that kind of. Yeah, yeah, definitely. They have their they have their no, purpose. No, but you know what people I mean? here really like that kind of stuff, and um, um, because it's basically rock music with Chris Barnes singing, if that makes yeah. sense, and a little harsher sound. <laughs> yeah. So. You know, people were in Germany, actually, that's one of the things I can say for sure. They weren't really crazy about necrophages at all. Like, they didn't like it. Trip. Too many notes. Yeah, a lot to take in. So they kind of started to appreciate it when they saw, like, oh, it's trending in the United States. Oh, what's happening there? <laughs> you know? Yeah. So maybe we'll take a second look. Interesting. <laughs> Weird, I yeah. wonder who the techest country is like who's into tech the most uh, canada 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 oh, yeah, yeah. Canada. good point yep. yeah that's a good call yep i would <laughs> yeah I would montreal agree. montreal if you know here's the thing um i don't know uh what what's your absolutely middle of the road country pop rock act is i don't know in, in america? america in america yeah. oh mm, man it changes so really often it, yeah <laughs> Like yeah. Neil Diamond or something. I don't know. Oh, like, yeah, like an old school. <laughs> yeah. 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 Call let's notes say or something. Canada, Neil Diamond is Rush. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Gotcha. So I guess, I guess it's just natural that all the death metal stuff is super wack wacky. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Yeah. No, totally. Because that's sense. like the yeah. exaggeration of everything, you know? Yeah. They're, they're, so, they're pop band. They're old school classic rock pop app band that everyone loves is a progressive like game changer for all of us you know what i mean and that's like they're yeah. like, like you said like middle of the ground like that's that's rush to them you know it's like yeah it's yeah crazy. ours is like acdc <laughs> oh yeah it's probably acd yeah something like that yeah 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 maybe acdc they're, is a better comparison they're australian right yeah oh so we're not yeah, never mind uh, i didn't even know that i thought they were english jesus no, who, who the fuck <laughs> Either way, yeah, we don't have a we don't have a rush. Probably Limp Bizkit, I'd say. You know, <laughs> <laughs> their singer like Fran Johnson is English, isn't he? I think so. He's... I think he might be. Yeah, I think there's English. Probably. Yeah, but I think the because the original singer, I think, yeah, he obviously, uh, had a alcohol issue. I'm like, Ugh. but uh, no. <laughs> but uh, no, he yeah, he passed away, and then they got Brian Johnson in, and I think yeah, he was from a different country. I think that, that, that checks out. I think. I don't know why I'm going deep into it. <laughs> no. Um, so back so, to Hannes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so you were playing in, in this death metal band in your teens, and then uh, you start Doing playing gigs, gigs with and them. Shit. And what was that band called, or if it was big enough to have a name? Or um, No, because there's no records out there. The band okay. is called uh, Devil's Cry. Uh, but you know um, why they're called like that? Uh, because um, I don't know if you remember that uh, U.S. metal band Psychotic Wall. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and their singer really liked that band. And um, that's how I got into Psychotic Wall, through him. And there's this like first song from the first album, which is called And the Devil Cried. So... Mm. The death metal band, they, but they got their name from Psychotic Walls, which I thought is interesting. So um, hmm, let's check these guys out. There should be more potential than the, you know, meat-headed uh, death metal they're doing. Like, yeah. So. So is that the first time you heard, like, technical or progressive metal? Um, no, I, I would say, um, well, I, I was into Rush, like, when... Through my drum teacher who was canadian there you go mm -hmm. um yeah and uh, um pretty early on actually i got into rush i really liked them and still like them a lot um i gotta say like the first two dream theater albums were like 
really, I would say, yeah, influential in some way because, um, um, yeah, that I never heard stuff like that, like with odd meters and you know, in that way, and you know, sh spread guitar Petrucci solos and everything of like that combined into this um, almost orchestral sound. I was really into that, like especially their second album. Um, that was one band and um, like the more um, progressive stuff. I would say what one band I checked out pretty early on was Symphony X and nobody liked them back then. <laughs> <laughs> or many people didn't know. They were like featured on uh, like um, back then we had like magazine samplers, like CDs that were with uh, metal magazines. Mm, yeah. Like, uh, I don't know, 18 different bands and 17 out of them yeah, I didn't yeah, like, yeah. you know, stuff like that. And that's just one band you heard for the here for the first time, and yeah. that was Symphony X. And um, yeah, yeah, um, that's music that really I, I don't know spoke to me. It's like heavy metal in some sense, but you know, a little more complex, a little yeah. more complicated, that, a little that, more, the Odyssey, more going on. The album the Odyssey, Odyssey yeah. is just front to back an amazing record. Yeah, and the and concept behind it, you know, even their new album. What's the uh, what's the newest Symphony X? I love it. It's like it's got like a really cool, catchy vibe. I mean, to me, I just Michael Romeo. I just love Michael Romeo. Mm -hmm. He's like one of my favorite guitar players of all time. Like, yeah, like I just love his like his free floating style versus like you know you compare it to something like uh, John Petrucci, which is more like it's very precise. Like all of it's precise. Yeah, yeah. it's like <laughs> it's like it's like are you guys like it almost but sounds like it's like yeah. Go ahead. It he didn't used to sound to sound like that on the first couple of records. Still oh, okay. accurate. I know what, what are you saying, but yeah. um, I think um, when you listen to the first couple of Dream Theater albums, it's more about the phrasing he does. The phrasing is really really nice, and the tone and stuff, and the ideas. I don't know. At a certain point, he got like into um, bodybuilding and <laughs> yeah, weightlifting, and then he started to exercise single strokes. I don't know like crazy and yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's where i thought like ah it's more technically more impressive but less intriguing to me but yeah just like the soul kind of like a, I don't know i don't want to say it takes the soul out but it does kind of he's so perfect hearing him jam now it kind of like doesn't there's not like a soul in there as much as there used to be you know what i mean yeah. like yeah so what's like, a single yeah, stroke it's just picking down only is that am i getting that right a single stroke um, I mean, I don't know. It's just, he's just like super buff, and he just goes like he's just fucking down pick. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I, I have uh, no think, idea about guitar. So when you say single I mean, stroke, I'm thinking no, you can mean, like jerk off in one stroke, dude. <laughs> <laughs> alternate means picking. Yeah, yeah. alternate picking. So oh, picking every okay. note as opposed to using legato, where you don't even pick. Oh, okay, the note. gotcha. Yeah, now I gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. gotcha. Yeah, so he he he's really into that, I guess. He went but through anyway, some weird yeah. phases. He went through. I remember just real quick, not to cut you off too much, but there was like me and uh, Carrie were hanging out recently, and there's this one video that we we threw on of uh, of of John Petrucci in um, Dream Theater, and he's he like went through this like kind of new metal phase for a little. Like he like had the like parachute pants on the column, but they're like <laughs> it's these Jinkos? pants that had like like these like like a bunch of these straps hanging from them, like like jinkos but with like straps oh, I know hanging what you're from talking them. about yeah. and like and he had the bleach tips and he was like he went he's gone through a couple phases so I call like, that super saiyan John Petrucci. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh man yeah, yeah, yeah but interesting to watch that guy progress though as a human being because he's you tell he's you know he's he's an interesting human you know he's kind of like a I don't, I don't want to say like, I don't know, on the spectrum, but he seems like a little on the spectrum, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that's as Oops. close as I can come to it. But, but, but he also like, you know, he's influenced with rock discipline that, that, that video that he put out, he's influenced most guitar players, you know, it's like Vinnie Cal kind of thing. It's like that, that video, like got, he, he taught you how to be precise and how to learn all the things. And like, so he's very important to like every guitar player pretty much, you know? But yeah, yeah, no, he's going through some phases. So, I would say. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Awesome. So, so yeah. Um, so yeah, maybe we should try to get up to your recording career and and how you got started with Necrophagus and recording Epitaph and you know any reflections you have on that stuff from from your present vantage point or any other recordings that we did before that that we should know about. Yeah. No. 
<laughs> so wow your first real introduction to the death metal world is fucking playing drums on epitaph dude That's yeah just come out of yeah, nowhere with that motherfucker. very difficult i listened to it today it sounds fucking extremely difficult <laughs> yeah. yeah it was um now it wouldn't be so difficult anymore like after years of i, I mean I don't play that exact style anymore anyways, but um, now I w it would be easier for me to learn it. Um, mm. But back then it was like really, it felt like starting from scratch with all that um, super precise stuff. And, uh, you know, um, yeah, it was quite a pain. <laughs> how did it, how did it work? So like, cause um, Muhammad had put out the first one like on set, right? But it was with the drum yeah. machine. Mm -hmm. And yeah. then w what year did he get a hold of you to do Epitaph? How did that work? Um, to be honest, we recorded in September 2003 and mm -hmm. I got involved like, I guess, um, seven months earlier, something mm -hmm. like that. Okay. So, um, yeah, it was this was this was a half a year of in very very intense practicing. Yeah. <laughs> did, did onset get re-recorded with with drums ever or was it just no. was always okay, okay. Gotcha. Not it's, just resampled, but yeah, um, right. You know the thing the pro, this is one of the problems, well problems, I guess. Um well for me as a drummer at least, it's the first album being recorded with a drum machine and that's your time reference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. like, if you have people and you have to say um I mean you have to give Muhammad a lot of credit here because he wrote the drum part. He wrote every, like, it's like a classical piece going back to piano for me. Yeah. It's like he wrote everything down in note by note and you have to perform these notes in the way they're written now. Simple hits and um, phrasing and stuff like that. Some things were impossible to apply, so I had to apply them in my way, but very little things. Most of the stuff is like just how he wrote it. Um, Even on Epitaph, you're saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, especially on Epitaph. Yeah, okay. Program parts and um, wanted that to be not an, a guideline, but the actual thing. And this is mm -hmm. the actual thing. Um, mm -hmm. uh, what can I say? Um, so would he just send you a song like with the guitars and drums already done? He's like, all right, there, there it is. And yeah, Matt, Matt kind of did wow. that with with decrepit yeah. and, and the like with diminishing songs and stuff. Yeah, like you can but the do thing some is, stuff, but... um, well, I mean, I, back then I immediately um, recognized that, well, it's his vision and his idea, and, he, mm -hmm. and it sounds very special, and I think we're on to something here. And if I try to bring, like, my... I don't have that much experience with that kind of music, and it's his vision, and I thought, like, huh, if I try to force my way in with my own ideas, probably not going to work. And yeah, he doesn't really seem like that type of dude who would be open for you know improvisation. <laughs> yeah, or, yeah, you no. know. yeah, no. No. yeah. He's very specific. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Actually, in, so, in one of the songs, I don't remember in the studio, uh, I got a like, I did a take and I got you know got out of the rhythm and I just improvised like some kind of wackle ish fill and I thought, wow, this sounds awesome. And he's like. Maybe next time. <laughs> Deleted it. <laughs> Just delete it in front yeah. of you. Like. I, I still think that sounded better than the original uh, part. Uh, but so, yeah. I love maybe, maybe next time, dude. This part maybe makes maybe more time. sense musically, you know? Yeah. yeah. Maybe. yeah. Also, it was like I did a flam, like, crap. He's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, yeah. Man, I love it. Yeah, he wasn't really uh, into the idea of flam why it's just hmm. it's got a it's got this supposed like like this because if yeah. you do a flam like crap it's just an untied <laughs> wow yeah just yeah. an untied single stroke what's the yeah. point of that and i'm like oh, it's a flam you know <laughs> yeah never hey, mind man. um <laughs> <laughs> but it was also a very good training for me um, technically and this was something i i thought like oh i can't actually you know get another on another level like playing wise and it was really hard and then in in the studio it was really painful to record that yeah um, i can yeah. imagine and then um yeah and 
How long then, did it take? Um, we recorded it, but we didn't play live for um, over a year. Or mm-hmm. rehearsed. I, we rehearsed a bit, but it was so hard to get back, to get all the stuff we recorded back then and do it in a live situation. And mm-hmm. I don't I don't know. My, um, like the first couple of shows, I think, I don't know, it sounded probably horrible because uh, it was just too much for me to take on. Like if you have... Um, the reference which that album is which is absolutely like perfect in that sense and Mm -hmm. you try to get that perfection on stage and that was really really um yeah pain also painful and a lot of effort and a lot of practicing and yeah did you play the maryland death fest with him did you play the maryland death fest okay so i was there i was there me murray the severed boys were all there and and uh it was funny to me because all the bands everybody would pit for but necro like anybody would try and start a pit and soon even that dude would just like stop and have to look back at the stage like you could they couldn't keep a pit going because their attention would be pulled away back to the stage just naturally you're just like fuck dude it's fucking necrophages i can't pay attention to brock and this dude in the fucking shoulder i gotta watch those <laughs> fucking fingers i gotta watch yep. that drummer play you know yeah yep well, oh, definitely. I remember uh, when, when we were practicing a bunch and this is like early on, and like with Odious and stuff, and we like got the coolest show of our life. We're like, all right, so we're oh, going to yeah. open this show at the Pound, San Francisco, and it's uh-huh. Necrophagus's first show in San yeah. Francisco, right? Is that right? Your yes. van got broken into that day. Yes, right. Yeah. Yep. True. yep. So we were the yeah. opening they band stole, on like, that two show. Passports were, so we couldn't. Yeah, oh, shit. crazy. Really. I, I remember mean, that now. I didn't Fucking see you bad. guys because we were caught into uh, somebody stole our passports. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, that yeah. show was so. so <clears throat> that sucks, man. But that show was so yeah. big, dude. Like, so we opened and we were playing it like I don't know, like five. It was like four or five, and it was like still yeah, light, yeah, out, light you know? out. Yeah. And we like the the show starts. There's nobody in there. They open the doors and we start playing. And by like halfway through our set, it was like packed. Mm-hmm. It was yeah. like nuts, cool. dude. At four or five o'clock, and then so many bands played that night. Like we should go over the the the, the roster. But I just to jump to the end. I remember like by the end of that show, that place was like. I mean, I'm pretty sure it was sold out and completely yeah, insane. Yeah, it was for sure. And I was standing behind you, Hannes, watching you play, and the first time seeing you guys. And, just, and to me, it was freaking killer, dude. It sounded yeah. okay. nuts, and people were going crazy, okay. dude. They were definitely pitting. No, I, I begged. Show. I like basically the promoter of that show. I was just all. He was like, he's. I was begging him because Animosity was playing that show too, and they were like, they oh, yeah. gave me the promoters like, oh, yeah. yeah, they gave me like a his contact, and I was like. We'll do it for free. Like I, I am, we want zero dollars. We just need to be on this bill. Like, so what was this all, bill? Curry, it ahead. was, uh, it was us to open up, and then it was uh, Alarum, mm-hmm. Arsis, oh, yeah. Arsis, dude, Cattle Decapitation, Animosity, yep, Cattle, Holy Necrophages, shit. and Necrophages. Yeah, it was, it was, yeah. you, it was your guys' first time coming to California. So I'm like, and you, you guys were like the band at the time. Like, it was like, still, I mean necrophages like has blown so many people's minds but it was like the band it's your first time we know it's your first time we want to be there we want to be a part of it somehow mm-hmm. like i was almost willing to like give a kick down to the fucking promoter just like i'll Pay give you a hundred dollars let me play it. yeah yeah <laughs> and like i was like i need to be a part of this you know what i mean and uh we I mean, fucking dude. did it yeah I and mean, it was like what, what casey said like we literally started playing we played we started our first song and they unlocked the doors and opened it so it was like there was zero people when we started walking as we're playing. Yeah. Yeah. It was like, we're just like, whatever. I'm, we're still playing the show. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. 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 And it's still like one of the more like legendary shows that I, sticks out in my mind is like, and getting to watch you guys play. And then, I mean, obviously like I first met you guys at, right after you got like uh, robbed or broken into and stuff. So you guys we're in the best of moods. But, yeah, uh, <laughs> I was going to say, like, we're talking about how awesome it was. And I'm sure Han, this is like, dude, I remember playing that show and just thinking, how the fuck am I going to get home? Yeah. No, I had my passport. <laughs> oh, OK. Oh. Nice. <laughs> Smart, man. Um, here's the thing. I'm not stupid. I carry my passport with me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's smart. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. I don't leave it in a so bag good. with an open window in the Bay Area of San Francisco. <laughs> so I, yeah. I don't do that. It yeah, may it's just move. me, but <laughs> it's a good move. Smart move. So funny. What do you so 
what do you, I mean, as far as actually, that's kind of like a nightmare situation that I have. Like, what do you do if, if you're in a foreign country and your passport gets stolen? Like, what do you, what's the process? Oh, you go to the, um, embassy. let's say embassy, German embassy in our case. Yeah. Um, and with, I think for Muhammad, it was a little more difficult because he's actually Turkish re- um, citizen, citizen and um, has like a permanent stay uh, in, in Germany. Hmm. Okay. Born in Germany, gotcha. but it you know it's not like in the United States um, that you're born there and then you're American in Germany. It's I don't know. It's stupid in my opinion, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, but it's complicated. So he had like all these forms, and then he had to call his landlord, and um, he had to find the forms like in his drawers and stuff like that, and to send it to the embassy and stuff like that. So it's it's really mm. sketchy if you think about it that. Um, this document grants you like permanent resi- residency in a country you grew up. This is kind of fucked up. So um, <laughs> yeah. I, guess, I definitely I understood that he wasn't in the best of moods. But hey, um, if that's like a vital document, keep it with you. Yeah. No, that's like yeah, I'm gonna call Keith real quick. I'm gonna call out Keith real quick uh, for Montagny. We had a LA show down south. I'll say it real quick. He had his fucking birth certificate in his backpack and his backpack got jacked. You're like, why does he have a birth certificate on him, dude? Yeah. Cause they're always like, they, they, they always tell you not to bring your social security card in your wallet and stuff like that. And things mm-hmm. like that. But, uh, but yeah, if you're traveling and you're just like, you know, that's like a like nightmare. Like you're in the middle of a foreign country and you lose your, your path home. You know, it's like, yeah, like that's just like a nightmare situation, you know, definitely. Yeah. But for, I mean, for us Germans, it's easy. You go to an embassy and then Mm -hmm. I I think because the bass player, like um, his um, ID was also in the back and um, he had to go to the embassy and I joined him. And this was really easy, like super easy. You go in there, like actually no one gives a shit because there's, this is in in New York it was. um, And there's not so many people going there because why would Germans go to the German embassy in America? They don't have to go there. Yeah. So um, there wasn't much traffic there. So um, it was really easy. Also, they filled out like a form because it's no problem re-entering your own country, right? I mean, yeah, it's just yeah. a thing like with flying and airlines. They might, you need an identification, of course. But mm-hmm. I mean, if you're in, in Germany and they you're at the border and they can look you up and that you get proof like you are you then yeah i mean that's not so much of a threat is it um no it's just an inconvenience yeah but but my experience with uh like touring like the one time i went to europe you know and uh when we got there like i mean because we went to all these different countries and had to show them our passports and all kinds of stuff and the the one country that was like always the nicest by far was germany like 100 percent. like yeah. we first got to berlin and they're like oh what's up like oh you guys and they're all like oh you play mad like music like yeah they're like super cool <laughs> like <laughs> off the bat <laughs> that's really? awesome you know, i remember that but so we're I, gonna gonna go from for here, so. I got a question oh go for it what okay yeah. i know this was the kind of cliche question but what was the hardest song to record on epitaph if you have one Mm, all of them uh, <laughs> yeah that's a good answer um, <laughs> no really all of them there was no no yeah, difference makes sense. equally <laughs> difficult i would say um yeah Definitely. um i would say um then playing live also i mean it's mm-hmm. just really not um I, I i would say seven is very difficult because of the septuplet thing Mm-hmm. It, I mean, it's very technical and fast, but on top of that, it's in septuplet, so that might might be an extra um, obstacle. Sure. Yeah. But um, yeah, that one is hard. But um, it doesn't. On the other hand, it doesn't have many parts. If you have like the second song, "Stillborn One," it's like nothing repeats, so it's just mm-hmm. four minutes of no repetition. Mm-hmm. So that's another thing. But that's to me was technically easier for some reason. I mean, hmm. yeah, hard to tell, but I think they're all pretty difficult. Did you guys use a click track live or, or just organic? Um, no, back then we did not, mm-hmm. which yeah, in retrospective would have maybe been a good idea. 
Right. Yeah. Sometimes, because sometimes it makes things easier and more steady. Um, yeah. But no, we didn't do that. I remember the first uh, first European tour we did. Um, we didn't even use a trigger on kick drums. Really? Because mine broke, and then it was microphone. So, hmm. <laughs> wow. Not really? ideal for that kind of music, I have to say. Because um, yeah. yeah. For sure. Sound wise, yeah. I would say. Yeah. But. Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. It's um, yeah, yeah. I guess that kind of music you have to put on a click track. I think yeah. that's really the way to go, and we should have done it. And I think later on they did that. They did, did that. On sure. the other hand, most of the songs were on more or less the same tempo. So mm-hmm. yeah. Mm. Well, so how how old were you when you recorded Epitaph? Mm, Twenty one. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. Nice. Nice. Yeah, I was wondering because I, I remember like you being like the the golden child kid. Like, like that, I thought you, were, I thought you were like eighteen or something when I saw you because uh, <laughs> that was like what people told me. Though that, that was like the yeah, rumors. Yeah, younger, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was the rumors. Sure. But yeah, no, it's that's great. I mean, having to be a part of such an epic fucking album, man. That's I mean, also you know, it's just like dealing with all the stressors of the perfection of Muhammad and stuff like that. Like, mm. do you look back on it like? with like rose colored glasses or are you kind of like I mean, was it kind of like a stressy stress you did not have fun doing it or because i mean because obviously mm-hmm. you have a guy that's very like particular about what he wants um yes i would say um in with any kind of like let's say um artistic effort like words like fun are not complex enough to describe what you're having but once it's I would say like, I mean, f- fulfillment is if something works and you get, you know, uh, also li- in a life situation, it really works and it flows, then it's very fulfilling, but it's yeah. more complicated than fun, I would say. But <laughs> yeah. um, this thing, fun, was really um, not happening very often. <laughs> like, <laughs> because it's so difficult and, and here, I don't know, it's... Um, Hard to tell. It would have been, I guess, it would have been easier with an easier uh, kind of attitude towards it. Mm-hmm. Because perfectionism is one thing, but um, it depends how you realize that with what, um, let's say, how you deal with people. If you're a perfectionist and um, you can be soft with the people, but... Um, really distinct in what you want to hear you know mm-hmm. but that wasn't really the case so you know personally it was difficult and the music was difficult too so it you know in hindsight i have to say but it's a great experience and of course it opened many doors so um mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah i definitely i never regretted doing it because um it taught me so much and i benefit from Macrophage just ever since. So after and that period, what door did it open for you first? Where did you move on? Was it Obscura? Was that the next yeah. one? Yeah, I, I thought like, okay, um, being realistic about it, I thought like, okay, yeah, I played with Macrophage just that didn't really work out the way I wanted, it. and um, I maybe uh, it's too much stress, and maybe the touring isn't for me anyways, and things like that. And I thought like, oh, I'll never go through that again, uh, but I want to do, and I thought like, actually I want to do my own music, my own writing. But I thought like, okay, well, if I'm competing like with necrophages then that kind on that kind of level, well, mm, I mean, who's waiting for my stuff then anyway. So let's be realistic about it. And Obscura was like really an underground band. Like, They've been some. They've been doing some touring and some shows, but and it wasn't bad at all or anything. But it was. It wasn't just on the same level at all. And it. Um. um and it. Um. I would say, uh, it, for me, it was more like something I could do while I was studying something else. I could um, have a band that's actually active and where something is happening and where I can do, like composing. I still had this vision of like trying to inco- yeah, uh, combine more of the things musically that I grew up with and uh, I was coming from, especially like the more improvisational stuff um, and bring that into songwriting and have, um, and bring like um, 
this um, prog rock influence is more into it's kind of death metal mm -hmm. and um so i still had this idea and then um yeah i, I with obscure like we hooked up and we did a demo and that got picked up by relapse records and i guess i mean of course a big part of that i mean you know i joined the band and it was only Stefan with yeah he was the only remaining member back then and um and i said like i know a guy i mean he knew the people that were in the band that were going to be in the band he knew them but they didn't have like an in incentive to join the band but then i said hey i'm in you want to join too because we need a guitar player I, or we need a bass player Jeroen, what's up uh, <laughs> i think we can create something here and then they joined the band and uh, we did a demo and relapse picked it up and yeah so um it's more like a second chance i mean it wasn't as big as necrophages but i mean i don't care because it was like my own shit i'm not playing somebody else's yeah. stuff note by note anymore mm -hmm. and um it doesn't didn't matter that it wasn't as popular because um, but it still was like a like a real touring functioning band with a record deal and going on tours like our first two tours was supporting Cannibal Corpse and that's like in United States and then in Europe and I think that's a perfect way to start and I okay. um, and that's I'm sure that um, because Necrophages was on Relapse and Obscura then got hooked up. I relapse and it's really um um yeah i think that there's definitely a connection there um yeah so i am um, yeah I, I think that also that um success that obscura had or has or whatever is for, to uh, some part I, I wouldn't exaggerate that but some little part there um or, yeah. or some of the basis of the success also is rooted in our, our work, like Chris and my work with necrophages. Mm -hmm. um, somehow, I, I, I've read like comments on the newer uh, Obscure that some people compare it to necrophages because Chris is in the band. I think it sounds nothing like that at all. I, it sounds a lot like Chris, but it doesn't sound like necrophages, even though it's very technical, but it's a completely different thing musically. I think that's so, kind of a perception thing too. Like I've, yeah. I've gotten many a decrepit birth, odious mortem comparisons and I couldn't see too much. I mean, I can't see really anything other than, you know, Casey drumming. And I think that's what it is. Like when people see an artist on one record, they, the first record is kind of what they, you know, burn their style into their brain with, and then they see the next one and they kind of just like look through it, a different lens and see it as something similar when really it's not because yeah. of the person that's involved. It's, it's literally the artist that they, this, I mean, I don't, do you guys get yeah. what I'm saying? Like, like the decrepit birth, odious mortem. Yeah. There's that's like never a, worked with me. That's like a salience factor, just like same person. So that's who you immediately think of when you start thinking mm -hmm. who it would Yeah. They're like. two completely different style, <clears throat> styles of music, but uh, I mean, obviously it's still death metal, but like one's decrepit's more melodic. I mean, they were becoming more melodic as we were, or like uh, Silver Savior on. and Odious being compared be to each other just because of my vocals, but really they're two totally different bands to me. Yeah, it's yeah. Like this definitely. sounds like Severed Savior. Or this sounds like Odious Morton, but really, it's I don't know. Like, I've, I don't know if I ever run into that much. I never really ran into people going like uh, comparing Odious um, or Severed to Decrepit or anything because I always thought they were kind of they're in the same we're in the same kind of like box, but we're like it's definitely two different styles of you know, death metal, you know what I mean? It's like, it's, I think it's it might be different people. directions, really, if you think yeah, about yeah. it. Yeah, it, it might it just be like what you're saying, like what, what Joseph's getting at is like the members are in there. So people are like, well, I'm going to link it like that. But that's going to already have the, the lens. Yeah, the filter exactly. of yeah. odious or severed or decrepit before I listen to. Yeah. Exactly. But uh, sure. going back to when you toured with Cannibal Corpse in the US, I saw that tour when it went through Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And at I the was, rave or what? At the rave. Yep. Um, and I was up close standing in front of Christian and getting to see your view of the, you know, the, the view of the, you playing drums on us. And that was, I was so into Obscura partly because of the same things you're talking about, which is I knew it was Christian and you returning to playing metal and coming in as, mm -hmm. as a touring band. Um, and I didn't know anything else about the band other than that it was you guys and that I had a more yeah. proggy, proggy style. 
Uh, and I was so into it and I bought the, uh, universe momentum t-shirt, which I don't have with me, but, um, and, uh, I remember when Christian brought out the seven string and played the title track of Cosmo Genesis, uh, when you did that song live, that was like, I think that's still the best, uh, Obscura song from, from that era. Um, so that was just super cool, man. So I'm glad that, that you picked it up and kept it going, you know? Hell yeah. yeah, because actually we wanted to make music, but it's, um, Yeah. Yeah, sometimes um, what it's really about gets distracted by, I don't know, business bullshit. Yeah, <laughs> you know? of course, of course. Yeah. Like the pressure of making it or being successful with it and stuff like that. So, um, or personal bullshit um, in case of necrophages. So, um, yeah, and that's really, t- uh, yeah makes me tired to think about it (laughs) yeah at some point um yeah well then you yeah go i don't know what you're talking about man touring is so easy dude it's the easiest thing (laughs) (laughs) i'm just joking i'm being sarcastic (laughs) what i'm saying of course when you when you group have group with people and you um do work together on something then uh, i mean there's always if attention or something like that at a certain point even if it's your friends but um uh, i would say um i've experienced pretty often that um this whole outside perception is seen more important than what you're actually doing if that makes sense and that you're defining yourself by um i don't know success or yeah. what it even is you know mm-hmm. and i think it's it's just a waste of time especially when you're like th- going through like a bad time just uh for what i mean why don't you make pop music then anyways yeah it's in my case with macrophages yes it's it's um very successful but if it's about that and you know selling more and stuff like that i mean it's death metal so um you, you know we take that so far yeah yeah so that's that so enjoy what you're doing and if you can't enjoy it then yeah uh-huh. we, we say that a lot dude it's for you first i mean it is a selfish statement but as an artist like you got to be you know satisfied with your work before you even want to give it I, I mean it doesn't really matter about giving it out but it's just got to be you first and your whoever you're working with like as a a group a collective this is this is our art okay now we're going to put it out into the world and whatever happens after that is whatever because we were good with it first you know yeah 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 so when does when did ron hit you up for yeah, uh, a lot of ask. science <laughs> i want to hear oh that yeah story. That came, yeah um yeah. i think oh t- uh, like 2010 mm-hmm. something like that mm-hmm and this was also by, uh, yeah, t- 2010 or something like that, because I remember, yes, uh, we were in tour with Cannibal Corpse, and I actually, Ron, before he did, like, um, the first Blooded, and before that was released, he asked, actually, through Muhammad, because he liked Necrophages, if I was free to record a couple of songs for that first record. Wow. Oh, uh, and um, but there was so much going on at that time for me. Also, like I, I felt like an just being a, like a, really a big pressure. Then I thought like, okay, I know exactly where it's going. I'm. I, I mean, Watchtower actually was one of my favorite bands. But I thought like, okay, I'm gonna take this opportunity and record with Ron Johnson back. And then if I happen to play like a non so good show with Necrophages, then will he? Muhammad will give me shit about it. I just know, knew that because that's the type of person he is. And I thought like, ah, it's not worth it. Oh, you're yeah. saying he'd dig in on you for recording with Ron? I, w- I think he would have. Yeah. I, yeah. I can't prove mm-hmm. it because it never happened, but I'm 100% certain. Mm-hmm. So um, like jealousy going in there. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's bullshit. Yeah, yeah, and, and, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, totally. You know, a waste of my time. Yeah. And so um, I thought like, you know what? Um, and Actually, this is also a part of the truth, or actually it's also the, the truth that I really had enough on my plate preparing for the Necrophages tours. So mm-hmm. I thought, like, yeah, this is too much for me. Yeah. So um, I would say, um, but then I told this story uh, to Alex Webster when we were, like, I don't know, waiting for the tour bus or something like that. 
said, I'm, actually, I was supposed to play on that. And now I regret it never happened. I should just have done it because uh, that album is awesome and I really like it. And yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is a fucking ripper. And then, um, yeah, after the tour, um, actually Webster got in touch. He wrote me an email. I was like, actually, we were looking for a guy to for the next um, blooded project, um, which was this like uh, um, EP. What was it called? That EP, which was that was super difficult as well. But that was um, more fun to do because um, even though it, it also it's also very precise writing, but it's my own drum parts and. Of course, I wrote him together with Ron um, because he's very specific what he wants to hear and what not. And, and um, also, he's a, I mean, he's a genius composer, so I got to listen to what he has to say and suggest. But I could create my own drum line with his you know, benchmarks. Yeah. And I, I wrote it down, and then I thought, like, okay, now on, on note sheets, it works perfectly. Let's see if that's if I'm able to apply that to the drum set and I had to rewrite a couple of stickings because yeah, not possible. I have, unless a you're not yeah. I have a question. So, um, what, when I was talking, like, we were talking about with, when we had Derek Roddy on, but he was going to do it originally, right? It was like kind of announced yeah. on the first one. And so what, when I was hanging out with him, it was like 2006 or whatever it was. And, um, we were hanging out and like, I was asking him about it and he was like, Oh, like that didn't work out for various reasons. But what, one thing he said was that, he didn't want like any ride symbol. Like it was just all hi hat, like the whole time. He just wanted hi hats on it and something. Yes. Is, but you did some ride too. So I'm curious how that worked out. Um, actually, um, the only ride symbol, um, I, as I remember it, is like in blast beats and stuff. Right. It's like the. Yeah. I know what you mean. Yeah. I guess that's okay with Ron, but I remember Ron like made a comment about, you want to use a ride symbol? What's next? A cowbell? <laughs> yeah, why not? No, I mean, yeah. Also, when you listen to like the spastic ink stuff, um, yeah. it's only hi hats all the time, right? Also, his brother plays more like on the hi hat. I don't know if because yeah. Ron wanted to be, or if Bobby, if that's more of his style. I think a lot yeah. of that's also of the blotted drums that I came up with is based on on Bobby Johnson Beck's playing right. a lot because I thought like. Here's yeah. the obvious connection. They are brothers. They do music like forever. And actually, he's a kick ass drummer. So that's speaking a good of role a model. ridiculous drummer, dude. Bobby, yeah, yeah. For, like uh, for me as a non, like when we're talking about um, Vinny Cal, you doing stuff. Like me as a non drummer, I always thought that Bobby Jarzenbeck was the most because he had those videos with the symbols behind him. You know, psh, psh, oh yeah, you know? yeah. I would just I would show that to my friends. They'd be like, "What the fuck is this guy? This guy's on a, like an alien planet." You know what I mean? You've seen um, his instructional DVD. Yep. Yeah, the exactly. songs. The... Yeah, yeah. Dude, it's definitely, yeah, so good. It's oh yeah, we, yeah, yeah. He plays for Halford now, right? Oh yeah, or he for a long yeah. time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Face warning, I think. Mm-hmm. Face yeah. warning. Oh wow, sure, I sure. didn't even know that. I'll check it out. Yeah, hell yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, uh, he's also he can play very differently. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, with Halford, and uh, he can play really, really um straightforward stuff too. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And really seeming like effortlessly and very groovy and totally musical. Um, so it doesn't mm-hmm. have to. He doesn't have to be like the tech robot he is on those spastic album. Right. Uh, really. Um, well. Uh, yeah. Uh, that's what he's. He's probably one of my favorite metal drummers. Um, oh, yeah. So that was a big role model for me for those blotted recordings because I thought it's obvious. Um, yeah. And yeah, part of that is this hi hat stuff, and I think with, yeah. And it depends. And, and maybe I, I'm not. You know, when working with um projects and stuff i mean project it's a band sure but um um if it's not my own stuff and i work with other people it's same with necrophages i i pre- if somebody has like a really distinct vision and i know this person is um a great writer a great composer in general then i don't really question that and and and, and sit there and say but i have to do my stuff maybe now even more because i did a lot of these uh, techie composition compositional things on the drums where I adapted somebody else's ideas and really worked it into my system. I always thought that I benefit benefit from that, but as the older I get, the less I want to compromise, of course. Mm-hmm. And I think like, no, um, I think I, 
do this so for such a long time i just want to be myself and play my ideas and my mm -hmm. style because now i have a distinct style and i want to use that unless some really crazy composer guy comes and you know yeah well read something i think so it's um so something I want to say to you, Hannes, that I've been like realizing yeah. here is that, I mean, dude, like just straight up, bro, like every project that you become a part of, like you make it like better, like at least in that period that you did it, like in my <laughs> opinion, even if it was all really like already really good, like the new Hate Eternal, like, like the blotted, like your, your blotted science album. And I love the first one. I love the drummer. Is it Charlie or whatever that did the first one? The killer job. The whole octopus or killer something? Killer job. Yeah. But yep. it's like... There's something about your, it's like why I like Epitaph more than Onset, even though a lot of people like Onset, like the, the you know, because the, the, they're original songs, whatever. But I, I like with the drumming, like you, you, you can take something that's super like technical and seemingly mechanical based on how it's programmed and make it sound human. Like, and that's um, insane, dude. Like how you do that. I would say for, thank you, first of all, I would say yeah. for, for Epitaph, I, I would give more credit to, to actually Muhammad because for writing the actual parts. I mean, of course I had to play it. But the way you play it, dude, like it's uh, not just like- But the way I play it, it's, it's pretty much to, you know, to the grid. I know, I but this, that. I'm still, I'm still, there's just something though, to, I don't know, for me. It goes back to like, like what Roddy was talking about and, and, and things about yeah. like it's in your hands. It's like, the, it's like a, right. it's a tone that you have. It's, it's, a, it's a style that you bring. It's not like, mm. a, like obviously you're, you're hitting probably note for note what he wanted you to hit. But it's a, it's like what he, like Roddy went through a big thing about like how he, how he hits and how he wants yeah. him to be, mm -hmm. he wants to be known for this tone that he has. You know what I mean? And I feel like what Casey's getting right. at too is like you yeah. have that tone. There's like a spirit a in your playing. Yep. There's a spirit there. It's not just yeah, like, oh, yeah, he's yeah, fast okay, and mechanical. I, I That's what I'm trying it, to get. Yeah. And it has expression too, like musically, like we're talking about being influenced yeah. by, you know, dynamic drummers like Vinnie Caliuta and all these people. Um, yeah, man. And on blotted science, like that's so hard to do. Like, how do you take something that's so just calculated and then make it sound human at the same time and flowing? And I mean, when, it, when I heard you were going to be doing that, I was all excited because I'm a huge nerd of Jars and Beck stuff, but I was, and your stuff. So I was like, Oh, this is gonna be cool. And it just came out like, dude, I, I love that recording. I, I rock it often. And when it first came out, I was rocking it constantly, dude. I think it's just sick as fuck, man. So, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> no, what is it? We tend I to do this on the show. We tend to like to yeah. fluff feathers of our guests because we love you so <laughs> yeah. much. <laughs> yeah, but I'm not. I'm yeah. not fucking around. I'm serious. Like, yeah, no, no. <laughs> Casey, about... Casey, yeah, Casey's like, oh, as you know, knowing Casey for how many years we've known each other, he's always like, you, you went. I mean, last, you know, about two out of three people that have been on here, like Roddy and you, like he's always brought you up and he's brought Roddy up. And to me, as a you know, like like a, a not a good uh, drummer just like when you have i see casey actually like actually being like dude this guy is the man like because i can't really tell i'm like yeah it's fucking sick is all i can tell you know as like a non-drummer but like the way that you yeah express yourself uniquely it's like it's it's important for the scene and important for metal and important to like have that kind of fucking that new kind of style it's not like his that's what Rod, roddy was getting at a lot with like all the editing and all the replacements and all the the soul kind of being sucked you know like and i can tell like you've always stood out as a person i can tell it's you playing you know what i mean and that's uh -huh. fucking awesome man so you have your own the thing voice. is i'm not um talking about roddy i'm not as uh i would say hmm, um puristic as he is because you sure. really yeah. do sound replacement and he really does do any editing right right and i know yeah. that because i i happen to to mix him for uh, a Nader Sadek recording, oh, which wow. actually was done two years ago, but it's still huh. making revisions. I mean, it's crazy, but um, that was great to see uh, like Derek's um, rough takes and mix with it because it's so easy to mix. Yeah. Um, basically, you just pull it up, do a little EQing, no, done. Right. Right. A little compression on the snare yeah. drum, and that's and then you really think like, oh, now it sounds like. Derek Roddy, there's really nothing, nothing, not much more I need to do. Just yeah. So, because everything is so consistent. Mm -hmm. Like, no matter how fast it is on the same level in terms of volume, 
And it's mm -hmm. really to total volume control. And um, so you don't have to do a lot of stuff. But it wasn't recorded to a click track. It was like all free. So um, that's also something. I think these days is very brave to do that because everything is so to the grid, especially when we're talking about like blooded science stuff. I mean, this stuff is like super to the grid. And I, I mean, here, and I mean, there is some editing going on there. Yes. Sure. Yeah. Because yeah. Um, this music only works if it's perfect. And when you do like a really, really, really good take, you think like, but this one note is off. Shit. Really? Really? Do I need to play everything again? Yeah. Or do yeah. I just you move that one note, please? Yep. Right. Exactly. Um, no. Yeah, I mean, you know. I played. And then you're in the studio, it's like another you know, time's over, and then yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean that. exactly. Yeah, it it depends sure. what the goal is uh, of 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 the production and the writing. <clears throat> if the writing seeks like perfection in the sense of mathematical perfection, then mm -hmm. that's what you need to do. And then you, because I think there's only one rule to make the music. Um, as good as possible and then it should be clear what you're going through i have the opposite um um example which i think uh, a creator um I, I always say that um and they're big bands so they don't matter if i, I it's not a rant I, I, no problem i i won't rant about creator <laughs> but um there's like one album they did with andy sneep where i was like i don't know where the drums were like super edited, like super quantized. And I, I mean, this drummer, he has a distinct sound and like Vendor has been in the band like forever, like ever since. And you know that, and then it's like put on a grid with like super, with samples and perfect sound. And no, it doesn't work. Yeah, it, there's, yeah, it, it doesn't work for that kind of music. Mm -mm. You can't produce it like that. Yeah. Also, I have another example Um, is like, some of the newer testament they have Gene Hoakland on it and don't recognize him. Mm, nice. I recognize some of the notes he plays and yeah, but sonically it's it's produced to perfection. I don't know if it's necessary to to quantize a drummer like Gene Hoakland. True. Seems to me like a, a waste of opportunity here because yeah, that's character and um and and I totally see why Roddy is not doing any of that and why he permits it and uh, not, not why he doesn't permit it to have an engineer sit there and like mess with his timing. He says, no, I want to, I want to keep that. Yeah. And then when you say, yeah, but this part could be, you know, more perfect or more tiny. He just says, no, I don't give a shit. Yeah. That's how it's supposed to be. That's how I played it. That's what I felt in that moment. And all the other instruments have to, play to that yep, to record yep. their takes on my time and i think this is a very brave um approach and i really appreciate it and it depends and, and for that like, especially for that nader sadek um recording that i mixed um that was the perfect way to go it it's so um organic sounding by doing that um and this is the thing also on this nile records it's you know organic sound uh, um, I mean, yeah, I mean, George Collias, he records, of course, to a click track, but he, there's not a single stroke he, he wants to have edited. He's really like, no, you're not doing that. And I think this takes a lot of balls, but also knowing that um, the music also allows it, um, you know, uh, the music benefits from that. Yeah. Um, whereas some things, like imagine like Mishuka or Fear Factory, um, Having yeah. like, let's say, uh, uh, imagine, um, you know, I, an album I, I really like is Sound of Perseverance by Death. Imagine that timing by the drummer on a Meshuka album. No, no, not yeah, working. Yeah. Wouldn't that work? That's what I mean. Yeah. So you have to have different things. And it's not for everybody. And the older I get, the more I move away from this super perfectionist um, computer time. I don't really yeah. like it. And I also think I'm not particularly good at it. Um even though the blotted and the necrophagist albums are like super, super perfect. This was a huge pain in the ass for me to record yeah. because that's not my, 
natural time feel. I'm more like coming from jazz drumming. I'm more like have a swing pulse in there. And that's for me much easier to do. We did, uh, a, with Obscura, we did a cover of How Could I by Sonic. And this was not very difficult for me, I have to say. Because, I mean, nope. I mean, of course, nobody played it like Sean Reinhardt. But, and, and you know, he, he was like a super unique drummer. But to adapt this sort of style in general and make um, with the ghost notey stuff and um, mm -hmm. all the jazzy stuff, to me that came much more easy than the super, super um, computerized yeah. um, necrophagist stuff. That's more in your in wheelhouse of, of what you're... Feel it. Yeah, so it depends how you play. What, yeah. Exactly. It's like how you play, like, personally as a drummer is more in the cynic kind of Sean Reinert wheelhouse rather than the dialed in gridded playing yeah 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 i mean and there's and like you know, what yeah, i think ahead. one one more sentence what i think roddy is totally right about um that this um excessive editing and quantizing has gotten way out of hands these days that you just that some producers will just um quantize it no matter what because yeah. that what sounds best i know i'm an engineer it's what translates best to an audio system because everything is mathematically the same. Eight notes are real computerized eight notes that your human ear can recognize that and the whole sound becomes cleaned up. At least it appears like cleaned up and then it's easier to dial in the bass. It's easier to get like the, you know, guitar frequencies to sit in. I understand why they're doing that. But I think musically in a lot of examples I just mentioned with that one create a record the next album they recorded live in the studio why did they do that i think it's obvious mm -hmm. why they did that because um they were like completely um yeah uh, uh not into the idea of having um super quantized drums and stuff yeah. like that so they did, they did the exact opposite and yeah. i think that sometimes is really necessary also artistically and um i think I wish more more um, musicians would have the guts to do it. Um, yeah, uh, I'm kind of curious about recording the new Hate Eternal one that you did. Um, yeah. How was that process? Because notoriously, like we know, like Eric is like, you know, you got to do it one take. And I don't think he's down with the editing. I don't know. I don't know how that, all that works. Whatever. Uh, I'm just curious. Um, uh, how, how to tell? I um, I always thought like... Um, that uh, working with Eric Rutan personally is like super easy. Um, it was super fun to work with him. Um, the music is just very difficult. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's 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 just uh, um, like uh, uh, yeah. it's like running. It's like really um, running a marathon, but um, with the velocity of I don't know hundred meters like sprinting a marathon that's what it is it's always fast wow. uh, always either super fast double bass drumming or, or super fast blast beats or both and um yeah yeah that was a real challenge for me because i'm naturally not the super fast double bass drummer i had to kind of on the fly develop a technique over a couple of months that will work for this kind of style. Um, Are you doing mostly singles or doubles or what's your Only story? singles. Okay, yeah, wow, interesting. Cool, man, that's so awesome, you're actually shredding, yeah. Singles game. It worked uh, to a certain degree, but it's, um, well now it's th three years later um, and I haven't practiced any of that anymore because it, it wasn't a good technique for me. Like um, physically, it, yeah, it started mm. to hurt and it started to give me problems. Mm -hmm. on my planes so i had to cut it because yeah if you do it yeah you know that you got to do yeah. it right with like swivel technique or something like technique that takes a couple of years to develop and yeah. to have a natural motion that you can apply on the drum set where you don't force yourself and your body to do a, a certain thing yeah sure. does it make it like less impact on everything if you find like a more floating way of yeah. throwing your feet like around relax you have to relax and i did the opposite i was like super stiff when i played super fast double bass for eight mm. eternal hmm. sometimes that doesn't work like in a live situation 
doesn't work so well. So I had a couple of shows where I thought like, eh, I did like that, you know, mm-hmm. to be honest about it. And then were shows which were great, where it worked totally. But mm-hmm. physically, it was just such an effort for me to do that. Um, oh, yeah, dude. It's and incredible. this has nothing to do with, um, you know, yeah. it's just, you know, the parts are the parts. But um, creatively, it was very interesting with Rutan because we did like a pre-production before that. And he... He would tell me all the ideas he had in mind and we tried to apply it and it kind of worked and we came up with mm-hmm. new stuff. And I, I was happy that I could like apply all the things that Rutan um, suggested. And I thought like, and I thought like what you're saying makes sense. Let me um, digest that and get a version out of that. How is this? And you know, mm-hmm. stuff like that. So you, um, we had like some programming, but it wasn't the real deal. So I had, I knew the parts in theory but he explained like parts so we go through all the songs part by part and write something for it like you know, this part how you want it and we did it pre-production and then it was pretty clear uh in the end um what should be there so um it was exciting to write that but physically very 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 difficult for me because it's yeah well, it's extreme music freaking good and, um, i'm album. not getting younger so uh yeah. <laughs> i would say like three years later um i wouldn't even be able to play it anymore i have to say you have to play that all the time or have a steady mm-hmm. you know steady rehearse rehearsing going on yeah but this kind of you know intense music i would say yeah so well, what I- are you working on three years later then what are you working on right now um actually the next thing is the new alkaloid record um yeah. which also is not going to be a, a walk in the park uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> it's going to be very difficult as well but uh, i have to say um actually um i want to try um to play things that don't give me a headache anymore yeah <laughs> i mean there will be a couple of things that give me a headache but um if i can keep the headache factor under 20 percent, then it's okay so what i want to say i want to have more headroom in my playing to just um you know not have not having to do like um not playing on 100 percent all the time but to have like some headroom to um maybe have easier parts that have more impact musically once I do something that is very complex. Mm -hmm. But um, I have to say, I didn't practice any of the songs. It's something I I always try new things. And, um, you know, I started out with Epitaph doing like stuff that was like 100% scripted, like 100% notated. And then the next album I recorded was Cosmogenesis by Obscura and that uh, drums are improvised more or less. Um, wow. You can hear that because it's not super clean or anything, but it's, yeah, um, I would say 70% improvised. Like I just had an idea what what should be there. And I know the songs in on top, uh, you know, inside of my head. So I practiced them um, and I went in the studio with a, a very, very vague idea. And I just said, yeah, hit record and I played. Did a couple wow. of takes and then we bustle together the takes I like best and that's it. So um, that was a new thing. It was the opposite of what I was doing with Necrophagist. Mm-hmm. You know, so that's um, what you're trying to do now is more of the just... just what I'm trying to do now is write it on the fly and record it. Like, um, I know the songs. I have written a bunch of songs and it won't work with all of the songs probably, but most of what I want to do is be spontaneous about it and write it while I record it. Um, sounds weird, but this is the approach I have in mind. I know um, the song structure and I know what I want to play there. So I can press, um, I don't know, play, playback, and I hear the music and I can develop parts. And most of the time, it's not going to be an issue. The, the tempo is not going to be an issue because it's not super fast music. So I can, um, at least it's not as fast as anything like in Hate Eternal or yeah. uh, Necrophages or anything like that, uh, except for one song, but anyways. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, for most songs, I can just um, 
come up with something on the fly and think like, this is a nice drum line. Okay, let's practice that for three minutes. Okay, this works. Okay, let's record that. Done, done. Okay, next part. And this is That's the actual cool. recording. Yeah. And what I want to do with that, what I, I want to, and it's more like a puzzle this time. Um, so you can tell that I won't be, um, that I haven't recorded everything from start to finish in one take, but it's like a, a puzzle piece. Yeah. And then I, I like start that. with the, with the with the part that I left off, and then I do the next part, and then I do the next part. But it's all very spontaneous. And then once I've recorded every part, and um, I listen to the whole thing, then it should make sense. And then I have to to go there and and say, okay, this transition doesn't work. Okay, transition. Now, what can I play? And uh, why I want to do it that way is because not only because it's very economic to do that, like time wise. Also, it uh, um, gives me a very naive approach to to uh, to the drums for this album, and most of the stuff because I will also be the mixing engineer for that record. And once I got to that point, I will have enough of the album. <laughs> you know yeah. what I'm saying? I mean, how yeah. I will have to listen to it very, very, very often, and I want to keep myself excited and fresh for the whole thing so i want to have a spontaneous approach to that with the drum line and try things and i'm trying to be able to improvise but then the music is too distinct to just play whatever so you need to play something very distinct it has to be the right drum line but i don't mm -hmm. want to sit there and spend time to write every note and write every part like on the computer in a like editing program or something like that i don't want to yeah. do that i want to to just record. And I think like, um, okay, this part needs um, a certain swing feel or something like that. Okay, let's get into that. What's the tempo? Okay, what can I play? Where are the accents? Okay, here are the accents. Okay, let's figure out the accents. Should I play Phil? Yes, no. If so, which one? When? And, you know, things like that. Because this is the, the process of writing anyways, but I don't want to write it out note by note and learn it and just redo it. Mm -hmm. But that's usually what recording is in, in on tech technical in technical music. I don't want to do that. I want to keep it spontaneously. I, I want to keep it spontaneous and um, um, just come up with with something. Um, uh, you know, uh, a gut feeling. This is a thing. That, yeah, uh, yeah. That I was going to just say that it's a, it's like yeah. a gut feeling. Just in the moment, you're you're grabbing the idea in that moment, and it's also not you know doing it that way gives you no time uh later to you know make a, a different choice or or second yeah. your second guess yeah. why you did this here and it, it's just done and it's done it's a yeah. it's a painting it's a sculpture and it just yeah. got out the kiln and it's fucking done you know yeah it's like a, painting is a good comparison because you have paintings uh, you know paintings are not put on a time code or on a BPM or on a measure. So you could take time, but once you have that color on there, it's on there and mm -hmm. you can repair it. Yes. If you think like, ah, it's not going somewhere I want, then you try to repair it somehow. But in the end, the, the painting is done and then that's what it is. Mm -hmm. I think, um, yeah, this is something um, that I try to explore this time, like really to be spontaneous, but in a compositional way. And um, yeah, let's see if that's working. I can't wait <laughs> to I hear it, yet. dude. I can't wait to hear that. So. Yeah, so, for sure. Um, that sounds awesome. I know uh, nice. you might not have too much time left with us, Hannes. So thanks for your time okay. so far. Uh, I just wanted to ask two quick questions. Hopefully sure. they're quick. Um, first uh, question is, how do you uh, write for your own music, your solo project, while also writing for Alkaloid? What what determines what gets uh, put on your solo material versus what gets into Alkaloid? And the second question is, will yeah. Alkaloid ever go on tour? Um, I can answer the second question. Yes, okay. we will. Sweet. Um, it depends, of course, on the offers that we get because we're like all everyone is 
you know, and the band is an old fart and we need to pay our bills. So <laughs> um, that's just real life restrictions. But in general, yes, of course, we want to play live. Awesome. I mean, that didn't happen in the past too often. We played a couple of bigger festivals, but not so. I mean, we did some warm up shows and then a couple of festivals. Yes, but that's not what we picture. We would go on tour. We had some offers, but mm, real life restrictions. Mm -hmm, so, totally. um, but to your first question, actually, um, I don't know. I would say, um, it's, it, if there, mm -hmm, I don't know, a gut feeling also would be the answer. I think if it is something that I, hard to tell the solo stuff you have to understand is for me much more like a fun project. I don't plan on playing that live or bring, yeah, bring that to a stage because, uh, yeah, I have some songs written and let's do them. Um, yeah. Most of the stuff is like techie death metal that I like listening to or, um, with, with a lot of melodies and stuff. And, but it, it doesn't, there's not so much, um, I would say progression going or, um, experimentation going on there. So the most of this most of the time when people are in bands, they um, have solo projects because the stuff they come up with is too wacky for their actual bands. And this is more mm -hmm. like the opposite. I think um, the solo material, some of the stuff would be too normal for Alkaloid <laughs> because with, with Alkaloid it has to be like um, more proggy and more out of the box and. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's if just I, so if interesting. I should, yeah. Um, compose a song with uh, just compose a song with blast beats and and some techy riffs. It's not gonna cut it, you know. Yeah, <laughs> but it will cut it for my solo projects because um, that's how I started it, and it's all good. I could do whatever. Actually, I, ha I do have some plans for further solo projects. Um, for the solo project to do um actually what i did was writing a couple more like necrophages style songs um i was gonna ask about that i saw you post a video yeah. or something online what was that that was it was like a song it sounded like you're like you're kind of laughing like it yeah, yeah it's it's a ripoff it's completely <laughs> uh, epitaph ripoff uh -huh. and actually um um because i had some spare time um and i yeah i just thought about that and I yeah um, I wonder if I could write something like that and well the answer is well if you have a blueprint of that and you've been part of the blueprint then yes mm -hmm. but it won't be something new it's like I call the project retrophagist so um, <laughs> it's really yeah, nothing awesome. special that's good. Um, it, it will good. be it's almost embarrassing how close it is to the original but um Maybe I'm going to release that. I don't know yet. Um, what if Muhammad ever did a Necrophagist album again? Would you yeah. ever record it? Mm, I don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> That's, I mean, so whatever, I'll go into it because I don't fucking care. Um, so, I mean, I, you know, I've toured with Necrophagist a bunch. I mean, not a bunch, but I did a tour with them. I know that Muhammad has a reputation of being kind of a jerk to people. It's just what it is. You know, you know you're smiling. So, I mean, it's like, it's like one of those things that he, I think he, he basically went, he came out hot in the beginning and was like, you know, he was Muhammad and he was like, he was the guy that was kind of the kind of aggressor. And I have, I have friends that are were teching with him, like doing the drums and stuff and the, the, doing the guitars and stuff. But like, I felt like towards the end, he kind of like realized he had this reputation and, and was started to be like overly nice. You know, you know what I mean? Like he was like, he tried, and and everyone's just all oh, he's faking it he's like you know okay but uh like working with the guy i can tell like i don't want to like put you in a weird situation but i know that like working with the like muhammad must have been kind of difficult as because i know that he's he's like an ingve momstein kind of like attitude about things you know what i mean he's but also it's kind of what you want from him because he's kind of uh he's he's just kind of like this tough you know guy is very specific and stuff but but was there ever a, i mean was like what was the heart? I mean, you don't have to go into this, but was it what yeah. was the hardest thing working with him? What was the the most difficult thing, personality wise or musically, going through mm. working with Muhammad? Yeah, 
Yeah, I don't want to go too much yeah, into yeah. detail. Um, totally. Just key, yeah, because he, he's not here to say anything, so that would totally, be totally. rather unfair. Which I would love to and have. Also, I think on. I would say, I mean, the hardest thing, obviously, from my experience, were some, let's keep this general, mood swings. Okay. That are not based in a, in a character or a personality. It's like maybe a condition, I would say. Okay. I don't know that. I don't know that. Yeah. I'm guessing that because, hmm. I mean, I was yeah. really young, so I had no experience with that kind of stuff. But now thinking about it, I thought like, okay, there's been, yeah, yeah. something going sort, on. And sort, where, yeah. well, where I don't like even that, know yeah. if you can blame the guy, you know. Yeah, yeah. You can actually say it's, his, you know, because, I mean, yeah. Well, I, a lot of those genius people, they have, you know, they're, social social yeah the differences than you know they're not the most at the norm with you know being a social person sometimes See, i've heard all this shit too but in my my experiences with muhammad were actually fucking awesome both times oh yeah yeah like me such too. a happy dude i i got you know at that show even after you guys got all that shit that happened to you with the car getting broken into and all that he he had a few beers after the show and we actually yeah. fucking had a, a lot of fun that night dude but yeah all the bullshit before yeah i mean it can be very nice um yeah but yeah i don't know it's um i've experienced multiple like what you're saying too i've experienced multiple muhammad's i've experienced yeah. the mad one that's the point the yeah yeah the the happy one i've experienced the one where he's 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 literally like on stage like where we're sound checking and he's filming us and he's, i'm all what do you why are you he's like on stage I'm like get out of here dude like stop, <laughs> like you're muhammad like stop filming he's all what are you doing he's all I'm trying to get ideas for the new album. <laughs> and it was like, it was hilarious. Like he was funny. And, yeah. but also too, like I've known many people that have toured with them and I've heard the stories and I've heard the things and I've heard the ups and downs and like, and there's obviously, you know, just knowing the members of the bands he's, or the, the, the band he's been in. Um, yeah. I just, you know, I, I'm just, what I'm getting at is I, I feel like necrophages will never happen again. That's my number one thing. Like, I don't think it will ever, you know, it's, I feel like it's just, you know, it's on his own terms. It just won't, you know, I don't, uh, Romaine was uh, texting me a long time ago. He's like, he's well, it's for sure happening. It's going to happen. I'm like, really? I don't think it's going to happen. <laughs> you know, it's like, he's just a very, you know, he's just, yeah. Like you said, just waves. Yeah. I could see, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, probably uh, this is a really just guessing. Um, yeah. Probably he feels a lot of pressure. Yeah, and he's putting himself under a lot of pressure, and he releases that pressure on other people as well. Yep. I don't yep. say this is a good strategy, <laughs> <laughs> but um, you're. Um, I mean, what can you do about it when you yourself, totally. you yourself, when you, you're going through some stuff? You know, yep. I, I I can't judge that. I mean, I really, um, you know, I mean, I, I gotta say. Um, um, my life pretty much was a cakewalk. So um, what do I know? Yeah. 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 I, really, um, I never had any hardship to suffer. Yeah. Personally, if other people did. Yeah. Did you find it kind of like a struggle to to break out of the box of being the epitaph drummer to be on your own and be this own unique person because you're the, the drummer of Necrophages. So it's like one of the biggest, mm -hmm. highest, like fucking mountains you can climb as a musician is like you were on one of the best albums of all time um like how was it hard climbing out of that box of being like i'm the necrophages drummer and becoming my own entity mm, uh, no yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah no i don't think about it like that you know you do what you do and then you did cool. it and that's in the past i'm you know I don't yeah. really um, second guess that stuff a lot. I don't. I also, you know, I, I would never uh, Google myself for stuff like that. <laughs> I'm going to Google you right now. I'm going to Google you right now. To me, it really doesn't matter. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Like this kind of stuff. So, um, but I hear it from people and it's nice to have an impact because I actually did play the stuff. I, yeah. Totally. Um, and also, this is one of the things um, about Muhammad, and this is maybe bring this on a more general subject, um, because I was um, with a friend of mine, I have this quarrel about Richard Wagner. Um, 
because I'm born in the town where Richard Wagner um, has his opera house. Mm. And of course, every child in my city knows him as a composer. And, you know, he's a, he's been one of like an extremely shitty person, like anti-Semitic, um, um, oh, okay. but at the same time, like halfway, like communist and at the same time, right wing and complete asshole, like treat everybody like shit, super arrogant, like the worst person you could think about reinventing the world of opera and um, writing some of the most genius recorded uh, like compositions in my opinion yeah. um uh so how to deal with that if you know somebody's a shitty person but a, a, a really good composer i think you have to separate uh, that yeah exactly. um this is always what i tell people um because i i see this tendency and um that a lot of people, especially when it gets some way political or something that they ban a person, or, yeah, you know, like that. And mm -hmm. I think like this has nothing to do with the person. Forget about the person that wrote it. it doesn't matter. Like the person is the person, but the music is the music. Yeah. Um, the music it's doesn't cool change. It. It's, it's the same. I mean, I guess there would be, um, there are certain, I would <laughs> say, um, exceptions like, what's that? Uh, Bursum or something like that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I would yeah. draw the line here. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's a one man project, it's a one man project by a neo Nazi murderer. Well, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe not so stoked about it. But, let's, be um, real. The, let's be real. The music wasn't, it didn't, he didn't have the music to back up the assholeness. You know what exactly. I mean? <laughs> yeah. I think so too. But I know people that think that his music provides something that is unique and they said, I, I know I hate the guy, but uh, what can I do yeah. about it? And I think like, okay, that's fair. I mean, that's, if yeah. you start buying merchandise, then that's on you. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. Um, <laughs> I think when you just, you know, um, you listen to it on, I, I don't know, YouTube or something, which, you know, it's probably illegally uploaded anyway. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. you're, not you're not supporting the band, yeah. but <laughs> yeah. if you love some, Body, you can't uh, if you love somebody you can't help and if you love somebody's music you can't help yeah. it either so it doesn't matter well, yeah. and i think like um you know um no matter if if muhammad was difficult as a person or not um um the music really stands out and it will always yeah. be and this is one of the challenges mm -hmm. if there's going to be a next album <laughs> the expectations have grown so much yeah that oh yeah it's impossible to do that well, if I would say if I mean it's possible, you know, I'm and mentioning that I am playing uh, drums and Trypticon, and you know, um, I think um, Celtic Frost have done it. Like um, their music were uh, in the '80s really successful and became very influential and these classic metal songs. And then the, you know, they were gone, and then they did in 2006 their comeback album Mon Monotheist and. And I think, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's the, in general, it's Celtic Ross, no, no doubt about that, but it's so yeah. much more. It's like a whole new chapter of, of that sound. And they really, really um, took that thing they did in the 80s and um, made it into something completely new, modern and up to date. And um, I don't know, it's the only re reun reunion album where I thought like, this is a leap forward. Um, yeah. and unless you cannot do that, um, then why even do it? It's like when Emp exactly what Ezon with Emperor says, like there's never going to be an Emperor album because we're so far apart and people would always compare it to the old stuff and the old stuff is good. So there's no point in doing that, uh, but they play shows once in a while. Yeah. And I think yeah, yeah. perfectly right. I mean, I would love to hear another Emperor album because I love the band, but Unless they feel like, hey, what we did back then, we can here and yeah. now we can recreate that, but better and you now relevant to the year twenty twenty one. Yep. And if that's not happening, so if um, necrophagist will happen in the future, then it should be not the necrophagist of two thousand. You know, the album came out in two thousand four. Yeah. Let's say usually if you take time, let's say the next album, okay, it's due. Let's say it, it was going to get out in 2008. Yeah, no, 
it's not enough. Mm -hmm. It should mm -hmm. be necrophages in 2022, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And not the album we would have gotten in 2008 because that won't cut it. That's people will say, oh, good album. I like it, but eh. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the bar is so high. You, the bar is yeah, so high for the epitaph is so high that like yeah, and, to, and that's yeah. what I always try to avoid with my stuff, that you put a bar up. I mean it's artistically it's the best thing that can ever happen to you because that is success as an artist. But it's also uh, <laughs> kinda um it puts a time stamp on on uh, an expiration date on on yeah, yeah that project. Like, it's like when the because, X Files uh, what, came what back. What can you do? Yeah, exactly. Now <laughs> I've reached everything I ever wanted with that album. What can you do? Quit, of course, or you will reinvent yourself. Or, like I do, you don't um, second guess everything. You just do it and put it out. Um, as as long as you stand behind it, and um, of course you shouldn't like just put out anything. That's not what I'm saying. But um, I got to do. It, yeah. So what they got to do is form a super group. And make this whole new thing with like fucking like Muhammad and get like Paul Gilbert on guitar, and then maybe like bring Jarzen back in there and just create this insane project, like and have like a different drummer every song and just do the most nuts thing that's ever been done. <laughs> I would say like well, super groups and stuff like 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 there hasn't been very many super groups that like as you see like the lineup, and you're like what they're in the same band together, but then they release something and you're like, did you guys just write this like the day before? <laughs> like it's it's always yeah. like it's like you know what I mean? Like it's never like. There, there's there's never i mean i'm trying to think of a, i mean there's a cool super group that's uh killer be killed or whatever with a guy from dillinger and, and it's got uh but it's got mastodon in it and uh, uh max from soul uh soul uh, sepultura so not to say soul Boy. but um it's got like it's a super group of like musicians together and that was like that's kind of, it's like kind of poppier kind of like fun stuff but i'm trying to think of like a super group that really like stood out like usually a super group seemed like they don't really I, kind of, I, it's like for the fun it's for fun i consider yeah. alkaloid a super group that works well yeah 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 exactly well, it's like Maybe an underground so. super group um yeah well i would say um yeah of course we took like um you know the names yeah you know you know you need to do, uh, to do promotion and it's nothing easier than uh you know putting that on the cover or you know it's like members of this and this it's like boom yeah. that's our promotion boom that's what done. we did and i know that that's this but i think um um that was never the idea but the idea always was to really create that music and i was like particularly looking for people that wanted to do that um, i think that's what makes it different it's not it's you guys actually had a creative idea to progress music yeah. not like not just get together and be like we're going to jumble our names together and do a thing it's like no yes. no we're, we're we want to progress something and do something different yeah and i think um I, you know i just saw this in, in in the obscura thing even though that's progressive music it's not possible to do that kind of music in an obscura um uh, um tag you know mm -hmm. yeah as obscura doing that it's yeah it's a too far stretch and um, so it had to be a new band. And yeah, we promoted it as a band of, you know, by this guy, this guy has played in this and this and this band because we all did a lot of, of stuff. Um, but really the idea was to form a real band and, uh, you know, uh, create a certain vision. Um, and uh, yeah, so yeah. Um, so I guess that that it really depends. It's just like you say. Sometimes you have the idea with super groups that they write um, all their songs in one week, like jamming. Yeah, yeah. Most of the time, that's the case because they don't have a lot of time left because they're involved in all these projects. And then they get together, like oh, in in my calendar, there's this one week where everybody's available. Now let's uh, write something. Yeah, they, exactly. You know, it's not really thought out, and uh, mostly it's it's like. It's interesting because people play in that group, but it's, and you will recognize the people that play in that group, but it's not really um, necessary in the artistically, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah it's yeah, more yeah, like exactly. a fun thing. Yeah. It's, it's fun. actually what I do with my solo stuff when I, you know, have guest guitarists and stuff like that. Um, um, I bring people that I really like and they play on, on some of my songs. And that's really it. 
but then I don't need a, a, a band for that. I can like, just, you know, put it out myself and, you know, do whatever the fuck I want. So definitely, <laughs> definitely. No, that's, that's definitely, yeah, that's the difference between like, you know, su- uh, the super group is just like the names. Usually it's like, Oh, Slash is in the band and the guy from Alice mm-hmm. in Chains. And it's like, you know what I mean? And like, they'll, they'll put out a song. It's like, okay, well, it's all right. But it's not like there's not a, a goal in mind. It's kind of just like a kind of quick one off thing. You know what I mean? But that's, that's cool. Alkaloid. So, yeah. um, so you're doing the Alkaloid stuff now. And is that, is there a new stuff coming out? What's, what's going on with Alkaloid? Like, exactly. Um, what's going on? The album is written and I'm starting to record really soon because drums are first, obviously. And, um, and you're yeah. producing it too, or you're engineering it too? Yeah. Nice. Very nice. Unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> how, how does that with like, I mean, not to like keep going because I know we got limited time, but like producing and engineering the album that you're a part of, do you get kind yeah. of like a, a different kind of ear fatigue? Like, because it's like stuff that you're written and then you're listening to constantly. Is there like a certain kind of like, like wall where you hit where you're just like, you know, yeah. it's too much yeah at once yeah yeah absolutely and um there's a danger um mostly it comes out of necessity but um the thing is you know it's 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 very difficult to produce that and it takes a long time to produce it but um if we had a producer who would have to get into the music and then it would take even longer yeah yep it would take even longer um to communicate what we want and it doesn't really matter uh, it doesn't really make sense so i rather do it myself even though that's going to be difficult because i don't have sometimes don't have the objectivity but this time i you know sometimes i want to have like other persons of the band like chip in and you know be there when i start mixing or something and start building sounds and it's a lot of building about building sounds so if, yep. if I get more help in that area, I will be fine because um, I think um, I have a picture in my head and, and, the, and the, the difficulty is to um, get that picture in, 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 a, in, a, in a sonic form. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Because, yeah, yeah, it's, it's just really diff- difficult. If you have nothing to do with the project, you're just the engineer and you listen to what, what is there more objectively and you're not so much emotionally involved. Yeah. That gives you the freedom to, to really make choices the choices that are merely technical sometimes, which are the right choices because of that. Um, it's hard to explain. Um, no, I, I get that. that yeah. I totally understand what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, because you, you're not artistically involved, so you could sit back and look from the, from the you know, hindsight or look in the at their project and hearing the sounds and stuff like that and you're like okay i see what you're trying to do i'll give you a you know more options to do but it's like when it's part of your like actual like writing that you're doing and then you're and then you have to engineer it like it kind of seems like it could be kind of streams crossing you know what i mean yes but i think um yeah i will have to force myself to be objective somehow you know it's possible um yeah, it's possible. Um, just uh, it's 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 uh, the role you accept uh, while doing something. You have to take yourself out of the equation then, um, and um, you know, yeah, there's no way around it. Um, so uh, yeah, but it's going to be difficult, I think, because um, the last last album was incre- it, it, extremely difficult to produce. Also, on top of that, the material is where it's not very homogeneous it's um you know we have like some of some uh, two two or three parts which are swings parts like real jazz parts and we have like a flamenco part in it um our singer has said he wrote an acoustic piece we have one song that is i i don't know seven over three over 15 or something like that it's like jesus <laughs> i don't know and we have one song that uh, Danny wrote, um, which is very technical and fast, like more in the um, super tech stuff. Um, then we have one song that is um, really groovy and not very difficult and really happy. So you have different sound worlds, uh, like general setups that you need to create. 
that interact with each, with each other and they don't they cannot um, contradict each other. So that's the difficulty when you, um, yeah, you know, with my solo stuff, it's a little, it's also difficult for me to produce it because I'm not objective at all. I try to to do that, um, but uh, yeah, painful to get there. But uh, yeah. yeah. Anyway, um, but that's easier because it's just more one sound world, if you will, like um, this death metal thing. And you need to dial in a couple of clean tones, yes, but in general, it's uh, guitars, bass, and drums. So, yeah, meat and potatoes. Um, but with Alkaloid, it's, um, yeah, some of the songs, they require several um, mix setups. So, difficult. Um, and then it should also, uh, like, yeah, possibly sound better than the last one. And, you know, all this all the pressure that you put on such a production yourself so a lot of work but i think uh, i think it will be worth it i think there's a lot um a lot of catchy material actually on the album incredibly difficult to produce very difficult to play but in the end it should sound like something that's coming easy and yeah exactly oh yeah fuck yeah guys well that's super cool it's Pretty late for you. Um, I think we are yeah, over two me... hours now. You said. Oh, okay. Minutes. Yeah. Then yeah. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> we tend to do that. Yeah. We'll get. We'll, we'll stick. We'll keep people along longer than they say they'll be along because uh, we have so much fun, right? <laughs> yeah, dude. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thanks oh, yeah. so much, man. Thanks. It's so man. great getting to hang out with you tonight. We didn't in the beginning. We didn't let you plug any. Where can anybody buy any of your merch and shit? Physical copies of CDs anywhere? You got Bandcamp or whatever? Bandcamp, yeah. Sweet. Yeah. Bandcamp is always, I think Bandcamp is great, by the way. Um, they take a little cut, uh, but you get it. And there's everywhere. Bandcamp Fridays where they don't take any cut. Yeah, right? there's yeah. A, that's cool. That's very cool. That's that a very cool. pro artist fucking approach. Yeah, and I really they are. appreciate that. And I can them. really yeah. recognize because on Friday, uh, there are a lot more um, orders coming in than usually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So people are really aware of that and support it. And um, yeah, it's a great can way. You show us? Sorry, can you show us that shirt you're wearing right now? Um, this one is not. Yeah, that's my stupid name. And <laughs> <laughs> hell yeah. But um, yeah, I I have some some yeah merchandise and CDs and stuff um on what what is the uh, URL? Um, it's Hannes Grossman. No, HannesGrossman.bandcamp.com. Yes. Cool. So very cool. easy. So check oh, him yeah. out on Bandcamp, guys. Buy that merch. Support him, dude. Awesome Most artist, definitely. <laughs> influenced us musically our whole lives, and I don't know. It's like someone just fucking buy his shit. I'm gonna buy a shirt right after I'm done. I swear to God, you're gonna see an order coming <laughs> for California, Santa Cruz, <laughs> and then fucking send it as soon as you can because I want. It. <laughs> yeah, I have to. This is one thing. Um, with a we didn't talk about Corona at all, which is a good thing. Mm. Yeah, I have to say, but uh, just saying that it's still an issue. Um, with post stuff and so when you order from the united states i don't know why but when you order stuff from europe it takes longer than usual it takes a couple of weeks yep and usually um the longest um i had people wait um on a regular order was like two weeks i guess mm. which i think is bearable but it's inconvenient i think it should be faster but yeah whatever customs and stuff like that but now it's really um it's like well, double, like four weeks or something. Like I had ordered. Sometimes, sometimes had, it's fast, but sometimes it takes really long. And I don't yeah, know why that's, that that's, is. I know it's I'd weird. I made an it's, order it's, from Germany like right before you, it got really serious for you guys where you weren't able to ship anything out of the country. So I was like yeah. waiting like, a few months before he finally was able to oh. send it to me, but it was well worth it. It was uh, Rainier Landerman's yeah. solo record. But yeah. Uh, yeah, well, it, yeah, getting it's it's kind of weird to think like you can't fucking send anything out of your country. Yeah, for a yeah. while. That's Still, crazy. I have like pending um, uh, um, uh, orders from Chile. I cannot send there. Wow. Due to Corona, I don't know why. Um, they just stopped. Um, yeah, packet receiving packages. 
be the, patient, yeah. guys, but support your your artists, dude. Be patient. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We're all doing this shit. <laughs> yeah, on that's what basically. I'm basically saying. That's uh, yeah. unfortunately, which for me is a huge pain in the ass. Mm-hmm. Um, the, because I hate making people wait for stuff. Totally. Out of my hands, but still, be, people, um, be patient. Uh, uh, it's gonna gonna be delivered there eventually. You go. There you go. Well, right on, guys. I love that uh, we had you on tonight. Uh, you're always Wait. welcome back. You know, if you want to give sure. us another 90 minutes in a few months or whatever, we can yeah. talk about whatever. Um, yeah, why not? Thank you, listeners yeah, and watchers, uh, subscribers. And if you're new, hit that button. Whatever button I'm talking about, you know the ones. Uh, we'll be back next week with uh, some more good shit, guys. Year two of Cali Death Podcast. What up? Have a good one. Yo.